Now, I need for you to keep your Bibles open and handy today. We're going to be doing a lot of reading. And we're also going to be doing much soul searching. You know, week after week, chapter after chapter, the book of Revelation has, through John's visions, shown us what has happened, what is going to happen in the spiritual sphere in heaven, and then the parallel events that will happen in the physical sphere on earth. And what happens centers entirely on God's judgment of His creation gone corrupt. It is important that we not only see this connection between the spiritual and the physical, but are aware of exactly the two different places, heaven and earth, where this series of foretold events occurs. So, as we ready to enter chapter 18 of Revelation, God has poured out the last of 21 named judgments upon the earth, the cosmos, nature, and humanity. And as usual, going all the way back to Sodom in Genesis, we find that God uses a combination of supernaturally caused calamities and He influences the evil inclinations of humans to achieve the justice for the wicked that He determines. For instance, we saw that the great harlot of Babylon, the woman riding upon the beast, will be defeated and destroyed not directly by God, but rather through the wicked ambitions of powerful and idolatrous kings and political leaders who at one time were her allies and clients. This mirrors what happened to ancient Babylon when King Cyrus led Persia to overthrow the Babylonian Empire. And yet in other instances we do read of great earthquakes, hail the size of microwave ovens, all right, and other supernatural phenomena being inflicted directly upon the people by God's own hand. And this mirrors the events of the ten blows that God inflicted upon Egypt in order to redeem His people Israel from the hand of the wicked Pharaoh. Revelation 18 then mixes the aftermath of those 21 judgments along with some pleas from God to His people that seem to have occurred at an earlier time, probably during some of the later judgments. But what God says to His people is profound. And I can only pray that those who today consider ourselves as part of His people, whether meaning physical Israelites or those of us who have been grafted in in a spiritual sense through our trust in Yeshua, that we will not only have the ears to hear but the resolve to act. So open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 18. Revelation chapter 18. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it's page 1549. Follow along with me, and then don't close those Bibles, or you're going to need them again shortly. <clears throat> After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority. The earth was lit up by his splendor. And he cried out in a strong voice, She has fallen. She has fallen. Babel the great. She has become a home for demons, a prison for every unclean spirit, a prison for every unclean hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of God's fury caused by her whoring. Yes, the kings of the earth went whoring with her, and from her unrestrained love of luxury, the world's businessmen have grown rich. And then I heard another voice out of heaven say, My people! come out of her, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not be infected by her plagues. For her sins are a sticky mass piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. 
Render to her as she rendered to others. Pay her back double for what she's done. Use the cup in which she has brewed to brew her a double-sized drink. Give her as much torment and sorrow as the glory and luxury she gave to herself. For in her heart, she says, I sit a queen. I'm not a widow. I will never see sorrow. Therefore, the plagues will come in a single day, death, sorrow, and famine, and she will be burned with fire, because Adonai, God, her judge, is mighty. And the kings of the earth who went whoring with her and shared her luxury will sob and wail over her when they see the smoke as she burns. Standing at a distance for fear of her torment, they will say, Oh no, the great city, Babel, the mighty city. In a single hour your judgment has come. The world's businessmen weep and mourn over her because no one's buying their merchandise anymore. Stocks of gold and silver, gems and pearls, fine linen and purple, silk and scarlet, all the rare woods, all ivory goods, all kinds of things made of scented wood and brass and iron and marble, cinnamon, cardamom, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, flour, grain, cattle, sheep, horses, chariots, and bodies and people's souls. The fruits you lusted for with all your heart have gone. All the luxury and flashiness have been destroyed, never to return. The sellers of these things who got rich from her will stand at a distance for fear of her torment, weeping and mourning, and saying, Oh no, the great city used to wear fine linen and purple and scarlet. She glittered with gold, precious stones and pearls, such great wealth, and in a single hour it's ruined. All the shipmasters and passengers and sailors and everyone making his living from the sea stood at a distance, and they cried out when they saw the smoke as she burned. What city was like this great city? And they threw dust on their heads as they wept and mourned, saying, Oh, no, the great city, the abundance of her wealth made all the ship owners rich, and in a single hour she's ruined. Rejoice over her, heaven. Rejoice, people of God, emissaries and prophets, for in judging her, God has vindicated you. Then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a great millstone and hurled it into the sea, saying, With violence like this will the great city Babel be hurled down, never to be found again. The sound of harpists and musicians, flute players and trumpeters will never again be heard in you. No worker of any trade will ever again be found in you. The sound of a mill will never again be heard in you. The light of a lamp will never again shine in you. And the voice of bridegroom and bride will never again be heard in you. For your businessmen were the most powerful on earth. All the nations were deceived by your magic spell. In her was found the blood of prophets and of God's people, indeed, of all who have ever been slaughtered on earth. The first words that we encounter are after these things. It's referring to John's visions, especially the previous ones of chapter 17. But these are not necessarily in the chronological order or precise sequence that the contents of these visions will happen. It's a pattern within John's visions that a subject or an event will be presented to us, and then later on, that subject or event will be revisited, and more details will be added to it. So in this next vision, John sees what he calls another angel coming down from heaven, and this angel has great authority, says the entire earth was lit up by this angel's splendor. Now it's common among commentators to declare that this angel is Christ because of his great authority and splendor, but I don't agree with that at all. This was an angel, probably a very high angel, maybe even some unidentified archangel. Nonetheless, there's no hint of deity 
Because as usual, this angel never speaks in the first person as though he's the author of, author, author <laughs> of the oracle he's delivering, nor is he the power behind the events that have occurred. I want to say this again. This angel is delivering God's message, not his own. The message is this. It's done. It's done. The destruction of Babylon the Great is complete and it's permanent. Now keep in mind that this is still an event that's future for us. However, similar events that we could call shadows, perhaps, have happened in the past. In fact, the connection between shadow and the culminating event of a prophecy that has yet to play out can often be clearly seen in some of the predictions of the prophecies of old. Zor and Sidon were often used in prophetic oracles as examples of places and of peoples and of unrestrained idolatry and of those who embraced the perverse world system. So let's take the time today to examine one of these examples that not only exemplifies what we're reading in Revelation 18, but clearly John patterns his narrative after it and therefore gives us, it'll give us some context from which we can operate. So I want you to turn your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 27. Ezekiel chapter 27. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it would be page 674. We're actually going to read two chapters. I told you we're going to be here for a little bit today. Chapters 27 and 28. And we still won't be done with reading the prophets today. So open your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 27. Follow along with me. The word of Adonai came to me. You human being, raise this lament for Zor. Say to Zor, located at the gateways to the seas, merchant for peoples to many coastlands, that Adonai Elohim says this, Zor, you have said my beauty's perfect. Your borders are in the heart of the sea. Your builders perfected your beauty. They used cypress logs from Sinir to fashion all of your planking. They took cedars from Lebanon to make masts for you. Out of oaks from Bashan they made your oars. Your deck they made of ivory, inlaid in larch from the coasts of Kittim. Richly woven linen from Egypt was used for your sail, which was also your banner. Blue and purple from the coasts of Elisha were used to cover your deck tent. The people of Sidon and Arvad served as your oarsmen. Your own skilled men, Zor, were there as your pilots. The leaders and craftsmen of Gaval sealed the cracks between your boards. Every seagoing ship and its crew came to you to trade in your wares. Men from Paras, Lud, and Put were mercenaries in your army. Hanging shield and helmet on you, they showed off your splendor. Men from Arvad and your own army were posted around on your walls. The Gamadim were in your towers. They hung their shields all around your walls, making your beauty perfect. Tarshish did business with you because of the quantity and variety of your resources. They exchanged silver and iron and tin and lead for your goods. Greece, Tuval, and Meshech traded with you, exchanging slaves and articles of bronze for your wares. The people of uh, Togarma traded for your merchandise with horses, horsemen and mules. The men of Didan traded with you. Many coastlands were your customers, giving you ivory tusks and ebony in payment. Aram traded with you because you were so wealthy. For your goods they exchanged green feldspar, purple stuff, embroidery, fine linen, coral and rubies. Judah and the land of Israel traded with you, exchanging for your goods wheat from Minit, millet, honey, olive oil and resin for healing because you were so wealthy with such a variety of valuable merchandise. 
Damasek, Damascus, traded wine from Helbon and white wool with you. Vidan and Yavan from Uzal traded ironwork, cassia, and aromatic cane for your goods. Dedan traded with you for riding gear. Arabia and all the princes of Kedar were your customers. For your goods they traded lambs and rams and goats. And the traders of Sheva and Ramah exchanged the best quality spices, all kinds of precious stones and gold for your goods. The merchants of Haran, Kane and Aden, who traded also with Sheva and Asher and Kilmad, they brought you in exchange for your goods rich clothes, cloaks made of blue material and embroidery, and cedar lined chests filled with multicolored clothing and bound with cords. Tarshi ships transported your imports and exports. exports. So you were full, loaded down, surrounded by the sea. Your oarsmen brought you through heavy seas. But the east wind will break you, surrounded by the sea. Your riches and your goods and your merchandise and your crews and your pilots and your ship sealers and your traders and all your warriors aboard and all the other ships in the sea with you will sink, surrounded by the sea on the day of your shipwreck. When they hear the cries of your pilots, the mainland coasts will tremble. The oarsmen, crew, and pilots will disembark and stand on shore, mourning aloud at your fate, crying bitterly, throwing dust on their heads, rolling in the ashes, shaving their heads bald for you, wrapping themselves in sackcloth with heartfelt bitterness, weeping for you in bitter lamentation. Wailing, they will raise a lament for you. This will be their lament for you. Who anywhere in the sea has ever been silenced like Zor? When your wares came forth from the seas, you satisfied many peoples. With your vast wealth and a variety of goods, you enriched the kings of the earth. But now you become wrecked by the waves, sunk in the watery depths. Your merchandise and all your people have gone down with you. All who live along the coasts are aghast at you. Their kings are horribly afraid. Their faces are convulsed. The merchants among the peoples are gasping at your fate. You are an object of terror, and you will cease to exist. Chapter 28. The word of the Adonai came to me, human being. Tell the prince of Zor that Adonai Elohim says, because you are so proud and have said, I am a god. I sit on the throne of God, surrounded by the sea. Yet you are a man, not God, even though you think that you think like God. Sure, you're wiser than Daniel. No secret can be hidden from you. By your wisdom and discernment, you've acquired wealth. You've gathered gold and silver into your treasuries. By your great skill in trading, you've increased your wealth, and it's because of your wealth that you become so proud. Therefore, Adonai Elohim says, because you think you think like God, I'll bring foreigners against you, the most barbarous of the nations, to draw their swords against your fine wisdom and defile your splendor. They will lower you into the pit to die, a violent death surrounded by the sea. Will you still say, I am God, to them who are about to kill you? You are a man. You are not God in the hands of those who defile you. You will die the deaths of the uncircumcised at the hands of foreigners. For I have spoken, says Adonai Elohim. The word of Adonai came to me, human being, raise a lament for the king of Zor. Tell him that Adonai Elohim says, you put the seal on perfection. You were full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were Eden, the garden of God, covered with all kinds of precious stones, carnelians, topaz, diamonds, beryl, onks, jasper, sapphires, green feldspar, emeralds. Your pendants and jewels were made of gold, prepared the day you were created. You were a cherub, protecting a large region, I placed you on God's holy mountain. You walked back and forth among stones of fire. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. 
until unrighteousness was found in you. And when your commerce grew, you became filled with violence, and in this way you sinned. Therefore I have thrown you out, defiled from the mountain of God. I have destroyed you, protecting cherub, from among the stones of fire. Your heart grew proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. But I have thrown you on the ground. Before kings I have made you a spectacle. By your many crimes and dishonest trading, you have profaned your sanctuaries. Therefore I brought forth fire from within you, and it has devoured you. I reduced you into ashes on the ground in the sight of all who can see you. All who know you among the peoples will be aghast at you. You are an object of terror. You will cease to exist. The word of Adonai came to me, human being, turn your face towards Sidon and prophesy against it. So Adonai Elohim says, I'm against you, Sidon, but I will be glorified in you. They will know that I'm Adonai once I execute judgments in her and show my holiness in her, for I will send plagues into her. Blood will flow in her streets, attacked from all sides by the sword. The wounded will fall within her, then they will know that I'm Adonai. The house of Israel will no longer have a briar pricking away at them. No longer will any of its contemptuous neighbors be a thorn to stab them then they will know that I'm Adonai Elohim. And Adonai Elohim says, once I have gathered the house of Israel from the peoples among whom they are scattered, once I have shown my holiness in them as the Gentiles watch, then they will live in their own land, which I gave to my servant Jacob. They will have security when they live there, building houses, planting vineyards. Yes, they will live in safety once I have executed judgments against all of their contemptuous neighbors. Then they will know that I am Adonai, their God. <clears throat> Notice this unambiguous connection. It's the reason we stayed here for so long. I want you to see this unambiguous connection and the characteristics of ancient Zor and future Babylon. Zor and Sidon Zor especially was the commercial capital of the known world. It was rich, it was idolatrous, it was arrogant, and it existed only for materialism and extravagance. Essentially, it is representative of Satan's kingdom in that era. All the nations attach themselves to Zor. They hope to ride her coattails to similar riches and glory. Zor saw herself as godlike in her power and in her influence, unassailable, impervious to the woes that others suffered. But like God will do with the future Babylon, he brought Zor to ruin in a day. The mention of cargo and merchants who lament the fall of Zor is simply another way of saying the word saying that the world economy collapsed. And so everything the wealthy businessmen put their faith in was crushed. God judged Zor, and he did it for the dual reasons of punishing her for her idolatry and for harassing God's people, Israel. Ezekiel 28, 24, the house of Israel will no longer have a briar pricking away at them. No longer will any of its contemptuous neighbors be a thorn to stab them. Now I point this out because it is fundamental to understanding everything that Jehovah is doing in the end times. Much of it is to protect and to avenge his people Israel. Too much the Christian church has misappropriated God's actions on behalf of Israel as though it's its own. And while some of these divine actions, no doubt, include the protection of believers, more often than not, they're for Israel's benefit. 
Now, to truly understand what's happening here in Revelation 18, we must also consult the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah has much to say about the demise of Babylon, and indeed it happened. And in the future, it will happen again. And that is typical of biblical prophecy. Open your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 51. Jeremiah chapter 51. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it's page 633. Again, we're going to watch this connection between this and Revelation. Jeremiah 51. Against Babel and those living in Lev Kamai, I will stir up a destructive wind. Against Babel, I will send foreigners to winnow her, to leave her land empty. They will besiege her from every side on the day of disaster. Let the archer draw his bow. Let him flaunt his coat of mail. Do not spare her, young men. Completely destroy her whole army. In the land of the Kasdim, the slain will fall. Those thrust through by the sword in her streets. Israel and Judah are not left widowed of their God. Adonai Zebaot. But the land of the Kastim is full of guilt before the Holy One of Israel. Flee from Babel. Let each one save his own life. Don't perish because of her guilt. For the time has come for the vengeance of Adonai. He will repay her what she deserves. Babel was a gold cup in the hands of Adonai. It made the whole earth drunk. The nations drank her wine. This is why the nations have lost their senses. Babel has suddenly fallen. She's broken. Wail for her. Bring healing ointment for her wounds. Perhaps she can be healed. We tried to heal Babel, but she cannot be healed. So leave her alone and each of us will return to his own country. For the judgment against her rises to the skies and reaches even the clouds. Adonai has brought forth our victory. <clears throat> Come, let us proclaim in Zion the work of Adonai our God. Sharpen the arrows, fill the quivers. Adonai rouse the spirits of the kings of the Medes because he plans to destroy Babel. This is the vengeance of Adonai, vengeance over his temple. Raise a standard against the walls of Babel. Strengthen the guard. Post the sentries. Prepare ambushes. Because Adonai has planned and accomplished what he promised to do for those living in Babel. You who live near plenty of water, so rich in treasure, your end has come. Your time for being cut off. Adonai Zephaot has sworn by himself, I will fill you with men as numerous as grasshoppers. They'll raise over you a shout of triumph. He made the earth by his power, established the world by his wisdom, spread out the sky by his understanding, and when he thunders, the waters and heavens roar. He raises clouds from the ends of the earth. He makes the lightning flash and the rain. He brings the wind out from his storehouses. At this, everyone is proved stupid, ignorant, every goldsmith put to shame by his idol. The figures he casts are a fraud. There's no breath in them. They are nothings. They're ridiculous objects. When the day for their punishment comes, they will perish. Jacob's portions, it's not like these. For he is the one who formed all things, including the tribe he claims is his heritage. Adonai Zevaot is his name. Babel, you are my war club and weapons of war. With you, I shatter nations. With you, I destroy kingdoms. With you, I shatter horses and their riders. With you, I shatter chariots and their drivers. With you, I shatter husbands and wives. With you, I shatter old and young. With you, I shatter young men and virgins. With you, I shatter shepherds and their flocks. With you, I shatter farmers and their teams. With you, I shatter governors and deputies. But... I will repay Babel and all living in the land of the Kastim for all the evil they did in Zion, says Adonai, before your eyes, Judah. I'm against you, destructive mountain, destroying all the earth, says Adonai. I will stretch out my hand against you 
to send you tumbling down from the crags and make you a burned out mountain. No one will make cornerstones or foundation stones from you again, for you will be desolate forever. This is Adonai. Raise up a banner in the land, blow the shofar among the nations, prepare the nations for war against her, summon kingdoms against her. Ararat, Mini, Ashkenaz, appoint an officer against her, bring up horses like bristling grasshoppers. Prepare the nations against her, the king of the Medes, his governors and deputies, all the land he controls, the earthquakes and rise, as Adonai's designs against Babel are fulfilled, to make the land of Babel a ruin, with no one living there. Babel's warriors have given up fighting. They remain in their fortresses. Their courage has failed. They are now like women. Her homes are on fire. Her gate bars are broken. One runner runs to meet another, messenger to meet messenger, to report to the king of Babel that every part of his city is taken. The fords have been occupied, the swamp thickets set on fire, while the warriors are seized with panic. For here's what Adonai Zebaoth, the God of Israel, says. The daughter of Babel is like a threshing floor at treading time. Just a little while longer and the time for harvesting her will come. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babel, has devoured me, crushed me. He left me like an empty pot. Like a monster, he swallowed me whole. With my delicacies, delicacies he stuffed his, bellis, his belly. Then he rinsed me out. But one who lives in Zion will say, May my torn flesh be avenged on Babel. And Jerusalem will say, May my blood be avenged on the Kostim. Therefore, here's what God says, I will plead your cause. I will take vengeance for you. I will dry up her river and make her water sources dry. Babel will become a heap of ruins, a place for jackals to live, an object of horror and hissing with no one living there. Together they roar like young lions, growl like lion cubs. When they are hot with desire, I will prepare them a drink. I will make them so drunk they will have convulsions, sleep forever, and never wake up, says Adonai. I'll drag them down like lambs to be slaughtered, like rams and male goats. Shishak has been captured. The pride of the whole earth seized. Babel has become an object of horror throughout the nations. The sea has flooded Babel, overwhelmed her with its raging waves. Her cities have become desolate, parched, arid land, land where no one lives. Nobody even passes through. I will punish Bel in Babel and make him disgorge what he swallowed. The nations will no longer flow to him. Babel's wall will fall. Get out of her, my people. Each one save yourself from Adonai's furious anger. Don't be faint-hearted. Don't be afraid of the rumors spreading abroad in the land. One year one rumor comes, the next year another one. Rumors of violence in the land, rulers fighting rulers. Therefore listen. The days are coming when I will pass judgment on Babel's idols. Her whole land will be put to shame as all her slain fall on home soil. Then heaven and earth and all that is in them will sing for joy over Babel. For the plunderers from the north are coming to her, says Adonai. And just as Babel caused the slain of Israel to fall, so at Babel will fall the slain of all the land. You who escaped the sword, go. Don't stand still. Remember Adonai from afar. Let Jerusalem come into your minds. The reproaches we have heard have put us to shame. Disgrace covers our faces because foreigners have entered the sanctuaries of Adonai's house. Therefore, says Adonai, the days are coming when I will pass judgment on her idols. The wounded will groan throughout her land. Even if Babel scales the heavens or reinforces her lofty stronghold, plunderers will come to her from me, says Adonai. An agonized cry is heard from Babel. Great destruction in the land of the Kostim. For Adonai is plundering Babel and silencing her noisy din. Their waves roar like the raging ocean. Their clamor sounds and resounds. 
Yes, the plunder has fallen upon her, fallen on Babel. Her warriors are captured, their bows are broken, for Adonai is a God of retribution. He will surely repay. I will intoxicate her leaders and sages, her governors, deputies, and warriors. They'll sleep forever and never wake up, says the king, whose name is Adonai Zevaot. Thus says Adonai Zevaot, the wide walls of Babel will be razed to the ground. Her lofty gates will be set on fire. The peoples are toiling for nothing. The nation's labor goes up in flames. Everyone's exhausted. This is the order which Jeremiah the prophet gave to Seriah, the son of uh, Neriah, the son of Machsai, when he went to Babel with Zidkeu, the king of Judah, that's Zedekiah, the king of Judah in the fourth year of his reign. Seriah was quartermaster. Jeremiah had written on a separate scroll, scroll all the above words describing the disaster that is to befall Babel. And Jeremiah said to Sariah, See to it that when you arrive in Babel, you read all these words aloud, and then say, Adonai, you have promised to destroy this place, that no one will live here, neither human nor animal, but that it will be, a desol it will be desolate forever. And when you finish reading this scroll, tie a rock to it, throw it into the middle of the Euphrates, and say, like this, Babel will sink, never to rise again because of the disasters I'm bringing on her, and they will grow weary. A lot of reading, a lot of words, but I want you again, notice, this is so critical, notice the similarities between Jeremiah and Revelation 18. Because indeed, this chapter of Jeremiah is talking about both the Babylon that existed in his time and a different Babylon that will exist far into his future, maybe even into our future. Notice how Babylon of old is attacked by foreigners. Thus, what happens to Babylon is not supernatural, but rather it reflects the evil na nature of humans who just desire personal power. Notice as well how Babylon of old was blamed for corrupting other nations, just as the future Babylon in Revelation is accused of the same crime. And God urges His people to flee from Babylon so they don't become collateral damage. So this historical pattern of the fall of ancient Babylon is brought forward into the end times. And what do we hear? Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. But even more. Because Babylon is essentially Satan's earthly capital, then we naturally read that its ruins will be the dwelling place of demons and a prison for unclean spirits and for unclean and hated birds. Now we can rather easily understand why unclean, unrighteous spirits would live there, but what's this about birds? It is that generally speaking, unclean birds are defined in the Torah as scavenger birds. Birds that eat dead and decaying flesh. And since death is the most defiling thing that has existed during human history, then those who prey on the dead, scavenger birds, are said to be imprisoned in Babylon. Now, I want to reiterate from earlier lessons that the Babylon of the future is highly unlikely to be a rebuilt Babylon of old nor is it likely to be a city that is even actually named Babylon. Rather, Babylon is representative of the center of the evil world system, even though there will be a grand city that will be the capital of this coming world system. Why has Babylon fallen? Not mainly because she's evil, but rather because she has seduced so many others into her idolatrous ways, and thus these many others are also going to have to suffer the horrors of God's judgment. 
This is why Babylon is figuratively, figuratively called a whore. Because, see, the Hebrew thinking is that the unclean whore drags other victims into her sin and makes them unsuitable for God's kingdom as well because her uncleanness gets transmitted to her clients. I think this is a good time for me to pause and make an application that we simply must consider in our modern lives. If we want not to be seen by the Lord as but one of the whore of Babylon's willing customers. Now, while often we read of kings and nations as being this harlot's clients, it's understood in Hebrew thought anyway, that this also includes the citizenry. So without apology, I'm going to be blunt. The evil world system of today has turned most of God's laws upside down. And those within and without the believing community are going to pay dearly for it. What God calls evil and condemns is today often declared as good and desired. The prosperity doctrine in the church is all the rage. But we are warned in the scriptures again and again that our lust for wealth and the material must be tempered. If material things is the unrestrained goal and ambition of our lives, then we are clients of Babylon. For God, sex and every aspect of sex and gender is sacred. It's sacred. Thus, not only is human sexual behavior highly limited, but so is gender identification straightforward and biblically uncompromising. Oh, this isn't popular today. But homosexuality is strictly forbidden. But it's a characteristic of Babylon. Transgender, while it's not directly confronted in the Bible, is out of the question. Because God makes it clear that whatever sex we are biologically as we exit the womb is who we are in His eyes. There's no provision to alter what He's created and ordained. To say that we believe ourselves to be the opposite sex from our own physical biology, well, that's just to deny God's order. And frankly, in my opinion, is little more than a severe psychological disorder. And it's become sanctioned as normal by many governments in this world. See, our treatment of those who murder innocents is plain and unambiguous in the Bible. They're to be executed. Why? First, because they're wicked. And wickedness must be removed from the community, else it infects the rest. Second, because innocent blood defiles the ground. And the only, blood, only the blood of the guilty can remove that defilement. This is one of the law's most basic principles. Housing murderers for life on the weak motive that perhaps one in a thousand have been wrongly convicted is not our prerogative. Housing them for life out of a sense of a better, more merciful justice, that's even worse. Because we are openly declaring, we're right, God's wrong. Those who believe such things, and I hope it's none of you, are clients of Babylon. The greed of wealthy businessmen who live a lifestyle unimaginable to all but a select few and yet so poorly pay their employees that they must struggle mightily just to put food on the table. They are emblematic of the values of Babylon. And God hates it. I mean, I could go on, but I've probably included sufficient examples to make the point. 
the Babylon of the future in many ways already exists today in spirit. And fellow believers, we must not succumb to it. No matter your political affiliation, which church you might attend, how your family and friends see it, certainly not according to immoral laws that our secular government creates, If we share the same values as Babylon, we will be judged as Babylon, even if we deceive ourselves into believing that we're righteous in God, uh, God's eyes because we insist we're following Christ. Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, only those who do what my Father in heaven wants. On that day, many are going to say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we expel demons in your name? Didn't we perform miracles in your name? And then I will tell them to their faces, I never knew you. Get away from me, you workers of lawlessness. So, what are God's people supposed to do? What are we to do? Well, that next part of God's message answers that question. And it is spoken from an unidentified being in heaven, as verse 4 says this, My people, come out of her. That's what we're supposed to do. I can only conclude that this part of the message is so crucial that God himself is delivering it since it's spoken in the first person. Obviously, the her is Babylon. But then again, who are those who God calls my people? Who are they? Hosea addresses this exact issue. In Hosea 2.1, starting there. Nevertheless, the people of Israel will number as many as the grains of the sand by the sea, which cannot be measured or counted, so that the time will come when instead of being told, you are not my people, it will be said to them, you are the children of the living God. Then the people of Judah and the people of Israel will be gathered together and they will, be, they will appoint for themselves one leader and they will go up out of the land for that will be a great day, the day of Jezreel. Say to your brothers, Ami, my people, and to your sisters, Ruchma, pitied. See, Paul uses Hosea uh, to show how Gentile believers are added to those called my people that originally consisted only of Hebrews. In Romans 9, 20 to 28, Paul says this, Who are you, a mere human being, to talk back to God? Will what is formed say to him who formed it, Why did you make me this way? Or has the potter no right to make from a given lump of clay this pot for honorable use, that one for dishonorable? Now what if God, even though he was quite willing to demonstrate his anger and make known his power, patiently put up with people who deserve punishment and were ripe for destruction? What if he did this in order to make known the riches of his glory to those who are the objects of his mercy, whom he prepared in advance for glory, that is, to us? whom he called not only from among the Jews, but also from among the Gentiles. As indeed he says in Hosea, those who were not my people I'll call my people. Who, uh, her who was not loved I will call loved. And at the very place where they were told you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. But Yeshua Yale, Isaiah, referring to Israel, cries out, even if the number of people in Israel is as large as the number of grains of sand by the sea, only a remnant will be saved. For Adonai will fulfill his word on earth with certainty and without delay. And even though we hear this from Hosea and through Paul, Jeremiah also echoes God's command to separate ourselves from Babylon. Jeremiah 51, 6, flee from Babel, let each one save his own life. Don't perish because of her guilt. 
For the time has come for the vengeance of Adonai. He will repay her what she deserved. Why flee? So that we don't share in the sins of Babel. And thus also share in their same fiery ending. It's clear. For every one of God's people, for anyone of God's people, to remain beholden to Babylon is spiritual defection from the kingdom of God. The concept's simple. There are some of God's people who are part of Babylon. So the proper response of a worshiper of the God of Israel is to take heed, to admit our complicit actions with Babylon and begin an altered life. We must come to the realization we cannot have it both ways, but then comes this moment of decision. Now, I want you to please hear me. Now, this is hard. But you know, as believers, we cannot be part of a church that protects its ministers when they commit child molestation and have adulterous affairs. Or ordains homosexual ministers, or sanctions gay marriages, or promotes abortion, or says no to executing murderers according to God's justice system, and then expect to be sealed and protected from God's judgment. Millions of believers are today living a lie. Walking around oblivious to their precarious situation because of a false sense of spiritual security. And are also completely closed to hearing otherwise. Because God's word has given way to current political correctness and a feel-good kind of religiosity that validates our own fluctuating and fickle emotions over God's commandments. I cannot urge you strongly enough to never darken the doors of such a congregation or institution. You have no idea how many emails I get from people who wish to get a positive validation from me by saying, well, they know how wrong their congregation is, but they've been a part of it so, for so very long, so they're going to be a trooper and stay and try to change it. Admirable sounding, but it's naive and it's disobedient. Nowhere do we read of God saying to his people who live among idolaters, hey guys, just stay and stick it out. What does God urge us to do? Flee. Like Israel fled Egypt the morning after Passover. Hurry, don't think about it. Go right now while there's still a tiny window of opportunity to leave. And besides, the odds of a layman changing the moral direction of a church or a denomination is so remote as to be absurd. Look, it's not the duty of a believer to change Babylon. It's the duty of a believer to detach from Babylon and leave it behind. Paul so also addressed this same matter in the New Testament, no doubt drawing what he's saying from Jeremiah. In 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18, he says, Don't yoke yourselves together in a team with unbelievers, for how can righteousness and lawlessness be partners? What fellowship does light have with darkness? What harmony can there be between the Messiah and Belial? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement can there be between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God says, I'll, my, I'll house myself within them. I'll walk among you. I'll be their God. They will be my people. Because Adonai says, go out from their midst and separate yourselves. Don't even touch what's unclean. Then I myself will receive you. In fact, I'll be your father, 
and you will be my sons and daughters, says Adonai Zebaot. Enough. You've been warned. I hope you take appropriate action if this at all applies to you. Now, verse 6 says of Babylon's judgment that she is to be paid back for what she's done to others. This is referring to Babylon seducing others to join her in her sins and immoral values, thus making them commit spiritual suicide. What's to be her penalty? Double. Double. She is to receive double the penalty for her crimes. Now, what this is referring to is the Torah principle of lex talionis, proportional justice. That is, the punishment must be uh, proportional to the nature of the crime. For instance, one cannot kill a person who steals from them. Rather, the criminal is to return the stolen items, add something more for reparations for his crime. So the Lord is saying that Babylon's sins are so egregious that proportional justice is off the table. She instead will receive double the penalty that is normally meted out for those specific sins. This is the justice Babylon receives, which offers no opportunity for survival, none for repentance. Harshness and finality are the bywords. Next, the Lord says that he is going to use the same cup that the harlot of Babylon used to draw others into her sin, a cup that was full of obscenities and filthy things that she fed to her customers. Now, in return, the Lord says he's going to brew her a double-sized drink. And we know from earlier verses that what God brewed in the golden bowls that were poured out upon the earth was his fury and his wrath. Next in verse 7, the Lord describes the punishment Babylon will receive for the glory and luxury she gave to herself. It shall be an equal measure of torment and sorrow. So there is a definite difference between the punishment that Babylon received for what she did to the nations in enchanting them into joining her sins versus what Babylon did for herself. She receives the standard proportional punishment for glorifying herself, but double the punishment for drawing others into her suicidal snare. Babylon viewed herself as royalty, a queen who only knows confidence and self-assurance, certain she will never have to mourn as does a widow. But of course, this was simply delusional. Economic security, power and position, that can all vanish in a moment. God responds to Babylon's delusional arrogance by saying their fall is going to happen in a single day. Every imaginable calamity, plagues, death, sorrow, famine, <clears throat> will be visited upon her at her most proud moment. Then she will be burned with fire. This means she will be utterly destroyed, because biblically fire serves a dual purpose, to purify the righteous <clears throat> or to annihilate the wicked. Now, how is such a powerful, per per pervasive, seemingly invincible force as Babylon able to be eradicated in just a single day? How is that possible? Well, the end of verse 8 explains it. Because Adonai, God, her judge, is mighty. That's how. Now, I want to point out something here. That those searching for answers about the end times need to take notice. Back in chapter 17, verse 16, we read, As for the ten horns that you saw in the beast, they will hate the whore, bring her to ruin, leave her naked, eat her flesh, consume her with fire. For God put it in their hearts to do what will fulfill fulfill his purpose, that has to be of one mind and give their kingdom to the beast until God's words have been accomplished. In other words, the supernatural part of Babylon's demise is 
that God put it into the hearts of those ten specific kings of the nations represented by the ten horns of the beast that she at one time ruled over in a special partnership that they should turn on her and destroy her. Why would these particular kings, I want you to just clear everything for a moment and ask yourself a question. Why would these particular kings commit economic suicide by killing the goose that laid the golden egg? If Babylon served the purpose of making them rich and powerful, why would they end the relationship by destroying her? It doesn't make any sense. I don't have a certain answer for this, just a theory. I believe it is that the religious fervor of these kings will be the reason, be the reason for their seemingly irrational action of destroying the center of the world's economy. I mean, let me ask you a question. Who has made no bones about it that they'd do such a thing in a heartbeat if they could? Today's leaders of Islam. So it's my contention that one likely scenario, at least as viewed from the history vantage point of 2019, is that the Antichrist is going to make a deal with Islamic leaders in order that they destroy the current Western-based secular world economic system in exchange for supporting him with their hope that this will eventually lead to a worldwide Muslim caliphate. A hope that has been alive and a driving force behind Islam since it was founded by Muhammad in the 6th century and never has this dream been more powerful among Muslims than it is today? The only unanswered question for them is exactly how to achieve this and which branch of Islam shall be the ruling party. Now verse 9 therefore speaks not about these particular ten kings, but about the other nations of the earth who've hitched their wagons of economic success to, Babylon, success to Babylon, unaware of what's coming. These kings of nations had just one goal, wealth and prosperity. So when these ten kings destroy Babylon and the world economic system, something that they are so very pleased with themselves for doing, the rest of the world's leaders are going to be in total shock. Those clients of the whore of Babylon are going to wail and sob over her destruction as they witness the smoke of her burning. Now whether this burning is literal or figurative, it all adds up to the same thing. A violent ending for Babylon that can only be the result of war. All they can do is stand at a distance, we're told, out of fear for her torment. In other words, these cowardly nations have no stomach to fight for Babylon and their economic system because they were so certain Babylon had it all under control. They do not want to share her fate of destruction at the hands of Babylon's conquerors. We will continue with Revelation 18 next time. Thank you.